Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, this is Ivy. Uh, welcome to the section um, Navigating Bias in the Workplace um, Tools for Inclusion for APAC. Um, my name is Ivy, and I'm um, right now located in Shanghai. And I'm um, very happy to be uh, moderating this panel. Um, I uh, belong to Shanghai Pride and I work with um, Alvin Eco in the last few years in collaborating um, and hosting um, DNI uh, China Forum in, the, in 2017 and 2018, 2019. So very honored to be moderating this um, exciting panel with um, amazing speakers from the region. Um, so um, perhaps let's so um, with um, introducing ourselves, um, and because I, I know this is an unusual time, it is uh, everyone is in their you know their home, their offices in their region, and perhaps I can invite the speakers to in, um, to introduce um, themselves, um, where they're from, where the base, um, which community they are in, and also to describe um, if what is the current situation or in terms of pandemic. And probably because, you know, it's been uh, more than six months since the pandemic, uh, you know, um, happened. Perhaps uh, also invite, you know, uh, our, our fellow speaker to share what have they, they've been doing in terms of, you know, taking care of themselves mentally and physically. So, Pratt, do you want to go first? Sure, I can go first. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for hosting um, this webinar. Really excited to be here. Ivy's right, I think it's definitely been an unprecedented year and I hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy. So my name is Preet Graywall. I lead inclusion and diversity at Twitter for the JPAC region. I'm based here in Singapore. Um, I've been with Twitter for just under a year and it's definitely been uh, a very interesting and a very uh, busy year. Um, in Singapore, the situation for the pandemic um, is actually getting a little bit better. I feel blessed to be based in Singapore. Um, I think uh, the, the containment efforts have, have worked fairly well. Um, it is still frustrating for, for many of us. My family lives in Canada, so it's been frustrating and a little bit sad to be away from them for so long and not being able to travel. Um, so it's been in, um, anxious as well, I think, for a lot of us in the same situation and for everybody, I think everybody is impacted in different ways. For me, I have three kids under the age of nine, so it's also been busy trying to make sure that their physical and mental health does not take a toll. So we've been trying to stay very active outdoors. Um, we've picked up cycling as a family, which has been really good. You kind of have to step in to be a parent, a friend, a teacher at times. And it's not the easiest thing to do everything, but, uh, but we've been able to manage. So um, a lot of gratitude from me to start this session. I feel blessed, as I said, to be based where I am. Um, and everybody is happy and healthy. Anita, do you want to go? Sure. Thanks, Ivy. Um, hi, all. I hope all of you are safe. Um, uh, maybe Corona has left some of our minds, but it has not left in reality. So hope all of you are, you know, wearing masks whenever you are stepping out, following social distancing and taking all the precautions as required. So um, I'm Amita. Um, I work with City, City Technology. Um, I'm the site head for um, City Private Bank testing. So. I'm part of technology, that's what I do. So I have a global team, you know, located across EMEA, APAC, NAM, LATAM. Um, it's a very routine kind of job, um, you know, so we, we basically test the solutions being rolled out to City Private Bank. Um, that's what I do and that's what, that's what brings food to my table. Um, apart from that, my advocacy is my passion. So I indulge in advocacy um, mostly on weekends or whenever I get time um, in term for inclusion and diversity. So basically to drive inclusion forward, to, to drive equality forward. So that's where my um, passion also lies. Um, uh, so yeah, very much excited for this session. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, looking forward to it, yeah. Thanks, Amita. And how about our um, 
our fellow Mao speaker <laughs> in the panel, Renza or Troy. Okay, okay, thank you, Ivy, for arranging and moderating this. Uh, hi, everyone, hope you are safe and well, both you and your family. This is Choi, and uh, my Chinese, Chinese name is Renza, but um, during my um, master's degree time in the US, a lot of my friends and classmates and teachers want to pronounce my Chinese name well and accurately. However, they fail. <laughs> so for your convenience, you can just call me Choi. Um, and uh, I took over the uh, diversity and inclusion leader role for Greater China Group of IBM starting from this February. And um, I think uh, my seniority in, in this field is uh, shortest. Uh, among the panel. However, I still find this is a fantastic field uh, in IBM and also beyond IBM. So I think IBM and I have been, uh, ha have been connected in uh, Shanghai Pride in this June. And uh, uh, both internally and externally, I think people who are doing BNI are innovative, engaged, and dedicated. And also, they all, all they always have brilliant ideas. So I, I think this is the most fantastic part. And uh, for me personally, um, I think uh, in China we are now in a recovery mode. And uh, um, Ivy can also share that now in Shanghai you can see a lot of people on the street. Uh, but however, you still have to wear mask and or you have to keep social distancing when you are uh, gathering with others, like in public transportation. However, uh, things are back to normal and uh, we are, uh, soon we, have, we, we will have a golden week. We will have a one week holiday uh, and uh, people are traveling, uh, releasing, refreshing themselves. So however, we are still, um, we still be mindful about the second wave and prevent uh, ourselves from being harmed by the COVID. So uh, I hope everyone, uh, no matter where you are, you are safe and well, and uh, let's uh, share our ideas on diversity inclusion and also how DNI can develop in the virtual world uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes or one, one hour. Okay, back to you, Ivy. All right, thank you so much, Aaron uh, Troy. Um, I just want to quickly introduce myself. Um, so I am based in Shanghai now, but then originally I'm from Hong Kong. Um, the last three years I've been in Shanghai promote, uh, working with multinational companies like uh, IBM or like SAP um, to promote LGBT inclusion and working with R&E Co to host uh, R&E Co, you know, China Forum in the last three years. But before we located in Shanghai, I was in Hong Kong leading the Hong Kong LGBT Workplace Inclusion, Inclusion Index, which is uh, a pioneering um, uh, tool to measure the performance of LGBT inclusion of companies in Hong Kong. And so that's how I, you know, start my LGBT uh, journey um, in the last five years. Um, so back to the panel. Um, today's section is really talking about biases and, and workplaces. So I would like to really define, uh, you know, today's uh, maybe 30, 45 minutes um, into three sections. So first we can discuss, you know, what is biases to you um, and or to your company. And especially now, um, the definition of workplace change because of the environmental, you know, um, uh, situations globally. So how the change in workplace affect uh, biases in, in your, inside your companies? I, I, I think this is the second part that we want to explore. And then the third part is the tools. So what kind of practical solutions or support um, you have been giving to, to your fellows, colleagues, or to your managers in managing the biases um, and, and this you know, changing situation? So, um, right, so let's start is what is biases? So what really comes to your mind um, in terms of, you know, biases? Is conscious bias or unconscious bias? So yeah, feel free to uh, start. I'm happy to go first if, if you'd like. Um, so to me personally, I feel everybody is 
a product of their environment. Um, I think evolution and social adaptations that we've been through would, would speak to that. Um, and we all approach situations and our own social interactions with the context of our own lived experiences and the various people that we might have interacted with and our own upbringing and whatever choices and whatever um, experiences, as I said, we've had. And we, I do believe that we bring that um, when we do interact with others now in the workplace. So when we approach a situation, the very first thought that comes to our mind when we meet someone, that to me is our unconscious bias. Um, I don't think we can fight it. I don't think we can, we can definitely mitigate it and we can absolutely navigate it. I think that's the core of the work that inclusion and diversity you know, really points towards. The first thought we might not be able to, to stop ourselves from having, but the next thought and the action that we take at that point, the pause that we take at that point, that is the choice that we have to be willing to make. So the interactions that we have, the context setting that we're now stepping into, unconscious bias will come with us. However, as I said, I think we just have to be very conscious about the next step that we take around it. Amita, I'll have let you chime in. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Freed. So, um, so bias for me is basically the tendency of making snap judgments. You know, all of us come from different milieu. All of come, all of us come from different kind of backgrounds, and we carry certain prejudices with us. We carry certain definitions with us, which are at times very box definition. So, um, you know, that also in a way. Um, nurture this tendency of passing on judgments around especially people that we come across and these judgments majorly are based on these uh, you know the prejudices the box definitions that we are carrying yeah unconscious conscious more or less you know it's it's the snap judgment that we make now um first thing here is we need to understand that we cannot eradicate biases it's it's inbuilt in our circuitry where humans we are bound to have biases that's where the first step is acceptance a lot of us or maybe some of us some of us live in this mode of denial i have gone through various trainings you know i am an inclusion diversity advocate i have so many certifications under my belt so i don't practice bias at all that might not be really true maybe you're living in some denial mode and even like these are two extremes that I'm talking about. Individuals who claim to be inclusion and diversity evangelists can also be carrying biases because like I mentioned, biases are within our circuitry. So acceptance is the first step. Yeah. Making peace with it is the next step. You know, make your bias an ally. And then the third step is investing conscious efforts maybe trying to reduce the intensity of that bias, you know, trying to eradicate that bias. Of course, you might not be, but then when you are conscious, at least you will reduce the intensity. At least you know that this is your action, which is leading to bias. So maybe consciously you will not indulge in anything like that. So yeah, that's, that's according to me. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Amita. Uh, so following Amita, I want to uh, make my understanding of unconscious bias a little bit theoretical. Uh, because recently I am reading a book around psychology. And uh, for me, I think bias is a kind of psychological disadvantage. Um, I think everyone, uh, to some degree, has uh, egoism. For example, this is um, this, this is something like our uh, psychological disadvantage. It it comes from our nature as human. Uh, for example, uh, we always think that uh, your own team may perform better than other teams. Although from the third party view viewpoint, the two teams perform equally well. And always, sometimes when we ourselves do something bad, we will always find a reason for ourselves. However, when others do something bad, we will blame their morality. So this is something called the psychological disadvantage of human. And the bias is one kind of it, one type of it. So when we see, the, when, when we see someone, we always see the similarities and we judge people and communicate with a with person based on the similarities. 
instead of recognizing the difference. So the difference always make a, make a big impact, make a big in difference. So, um, however, we always ignore it. Uh, if the people you are dealing with, you are connecting with is a minority, then ignoring the difference can be very harmful for them. So I think this is something um, that, that from my, my understanding, unconscious bias or uh, no matter unconscious or conscious, uh, or conscious bias, um, they are a psychological pitfall. Uh, but I want to echo Amita's point of view that to overcome this, we need to change unconscious bias to conscious unbias. Conscious unbias is a new word that proposed by, by IBM. That means that you proactively learn what kind of disadvantage you may have when you are dealing with people with difference. So uh, after you recognize the difference, then you consciously perform against the bias. So this is a conscious unbias. Okay, that's, this is my, uh, my understanding. Back to you, Ivy. Great, thank you. Uh, wow, that's, that's a very impressive um, explanation, uh, definition of biases. So what I can hear just now is really, you know, biases um, is really something that um, you cannot stop yourself having biases and something that you cannot escape. And also what uh, Troy mentioned is uh, psychologically uh, disadvantage. But after having all these, you know, unconscious bias, when you meet someone that probably uh, different from you or like your first time meet someone, then, you know, you should be able to uh, making some conscious effort in, you know, reducing the intensity and, you know, and against this bias. So um, I think later in the part of the consultation, we will um, discuss how, um, if, uh, you know, everyone can do to, uh, to play their part in reducing the intensity. So um, I just want to um, deep dive into, you know, um, what, uh, focusing on what place. Um, since, you know, the definition of what place change, as, uh, you know, Pratt mentioned earlier in her introduction, she um, had, you know, in, in uh, outside work, she had different roles as a mom, you know, take care of the kids um, to make sure, you know, they are, they can study well at home, you know, during the quarantine. So, you know, office now change. It can be like uh, home with parents, with your kids, with your partner, or even with your pets. Um, so I just wonder if you see any differences of bias towards LGBT or any other diverse uh, employees in office versus uh, virtually at home in your country. Mm. Feel free to start if you have um, anything to contribute. Maybe we can change the sequence. <laughs> Maybe start from me. Oh, yeah, time. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, I think um, I work in IBM and IBM has a very long history of working remotely. Uh, so actually, I have to say that uh, for some of our colleagues, uh, we don't always see each other even before COVID. Sometimes you only see um, see one of your colleagues maybe only one or two times a year um, because they are coming to submit the invoice of the travel. So, so this is uh, only opportunities. Uh, however, uh, after the COVID, we see a very, very large volume of working from home in IBM. It still uh, have some challenge. We still have some challenge compared with before, although we already have a long history. So uh, I think in terms of bias, um, actually I don't think uh, working virtually or working physically connected have any big difference around the types of bias. However, the, when, when we are working virtually, the bias can be exaggerated or amplified. For example, uh, let me let, let me take a working mother for example. So uh, when you when you know that um, your teammate or your support, subordinate is a working mother, when you are working physically together, you know that she is working. However, when she when you are working virtually and you can't see her every day every uh, every minute, then you may guess you may guess 
is she taking care of the family? Is she really working? So you may guess the imagination, people's Im imagination can be very harmful. When you don't know the truth, you imagine. So this is a, this is a very risky situation. So let, 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 let's say LGBT group. So um, when you are, maybe you, when you are doing a video conference, uh, sometimes uh, some people are not very convenient to open a video. So um, if you know someone is an LGBT and uh, he or she told you that, tells you that I'm not convenient to open my video, you may guess what you are doing. LGBT group is always so special. So the unconscious bias in your mind is being amplified. And also uh, for PWD group, you know, IBM has a lot of PWD, people with disability working in IBM. So uh, for them, working virtually is, uh, is kind of a difficult. It's kind of very difficult for them because they have to, um, for, for example, some uh, visually impaired people, they can't see the screen very well and uh, uh, some people can't hear very well. So in the, when you are working virtually, the technology can be a challenge for them. When technology can be a challenge for them, their performance can be influenced. So uh, when their performance is being influenced, you, will, you may assume that pe people with disability, maybe they are not as skillful as, as others. This is your assumption. However, it's not true. That is just because of technology challenge. So I think uh, in the virtual world, the bias can be amplified. It, maybe there is no new bias, but we need to be cautious about, the, uh, about this about this situation. This is my uh, understanding of this topic. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. I uh, might just add to that. Oh, sorry, Amita. Uh, oh, sorry, you can go ahead, whatever is. Um, no worries. No, just to add to that, I think you've absolutely captured so many of, um, of I think, a lot of our common company sentiments. But yes, I think, um, you know, I definitely feel blessed again to be able to be able to work in a tech company where we are able to leverage technology to that extent where working from home um, has not necessarily been a huge um, shift away for, for many of us. But I think the, the year itself, though, in the context of the pandemic and everything that has happened, it definitely has added stress to so many uh, of our colleagues as well. So whether you're living alone and it's the frustration because you can't go anywhere, or you've been missing out on social interactions or kids in my case, or even if you're taking care of, let's say, um, elderly parents or any of you are a caregiver in any capacity, I think it's definitely added a lot of um, stress to those situations for employees. So I, th I think it's just amplified the need that, yes, unconscious bias might creep in and people absolutely need to be able to lead with empathy and be there for your, for your team. Um, we've really encouraged at Twitter that people have open conversations with their teams around what works. We have like a team working document that we've really been able to amplify and say, individually talk to people and what works best for them and be willing to meet them at their intersections, wherever, whatever those might be. That is the only way companies can really step up and show up in, in situations like this. Um, we've leaned very heavily on our business resource groups like Twitter parents or Twitter women um, and really understand, well, what are some of the needs on the ground for our employees? And it was actually about the conscious bias of some of our teammates, perhaps not understanding once again, that just because you are in a virtual working from home setting, it's not easily adaptable to be able to now continue delivering at the same capacity that people were doing when they were potentially working from, from the office. Um, and we've had to then think about not just some tangible benefits, you know, to give to the employees, but also have conversations about uh, what works best for managers in managing people that are now virtually working from, uh, from home or actually living at work now is, is what it is. So it's definitely been additional resources that we've had to step up because not just con unconscious bias, but we were, we were seeing consciously people need to, need to lean in a lot more and be a lot more empathetic to different situations. Sorry, Amita, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'd love to hear no, more. No. That's thanks. Thanks for adding those views. Now, um, from my side to add two cents. So um, initially, let's see, it was a very human kind of a managerial tendency. There were a lot of apprehensions when it comes to work from home. In general, I'm saying the regional, the continent or, you know, which 
part of the world you belong to doesn't really matter. It was very human tendency specific. That myth has been bursted because everybody is majorly working from home and the productivity is not impacted. So now this has been an eye opener for so many individuals that work from home can deliver the same results. Yeah. Then when it comes to biases, so we'll have to now rehash or redefine or increase our definition of biases. Like for example, some individuals had guarded their private lives from the professional lives. Some individuals did believe in having this clear segregation between personal life and professional life. They never mix these two. Now in this new normal, offices have entered our houses. That means that segregation no more really exists. That's where these individuals are going to face difficulties maybe once we are back to site. Now, if I need to speak specifically for the LGBTI plus community, so when it comes to LGBTI plus community, not everybody is out at the workplace. Reasons could be because it's, it's a choice at the end of the day. Just because the organization is very inclusive, having completely inclusive policies and framework in place, doesn't mean every individual will be, will be comfortable coming out at the workplace. Now, individual, let's say a gay man who is living with his partner, same sex, homosexual partner, same gender partner, the offices have entered in the houses. So on the video calls, on these office calls, which are running constantly rampantly, there is this possibility that, you know, this private side of that individual is going to get exposed, which that individual might not be comfortable with. Same for, let's say, lesbian couples. Yeah. Now, if you look at the transgenders, so transgenders who are in the middle of transition, who have embarked upon the journey of medical transition, that is going to impact their physical appearance, right? So when work from home started, that individual used to look in a different way. Now, six months down the line, the individual's appearance and looks are changing. So of course, the colleagues and all are going to react to it differently. What is going on? What is wrong with this person? So these are some new biases, which are maybe very specific and grave for the LGBTI plus community, which, you know, I have started creeping in because of this distant kind of working. And that's where organizations will have to uh, rehash their definition of biases. And these are some new use cases, which organizations maybe need to deal with one on one basis. So like when I speak for the trans individuals, so maybe organizations will have to consciously invest efforts now in carrying out sensitization workshops specific, you know, to such cases. So yeah, yeah, that's what I think. Okay, um, great, thank you. So um, what I can hear from, from all of you is really, um, you know, when compared virtually versus, you know, um, into really the offices, the bias um, can be exaggerated, amplified, um, and it can be, um, you know, can be made more difficult for people, especially for people with disabilities uh, when they do not have, you know, uh, enough sufficient um, tools for them to um, support, you know, their work um, online. And also offices um, become, um, you know, part of the home, um, part of the private life. Um, you know, um, the biases are also, um, you know, uh, become new and become, uh, uh, Redefined. So I just uh, wonder, um, in the last six months, if you have been um, in your in your company or in your offices, if you have been um, doing some awareness uh, program on raising, um, you know, and biases um, to your employees, and if yes, um, during your process, what have you learned from raising, um, you know, all this awareness program on biases? Um, to your colleagues. Prag, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure, I can go. Um, 100%, I think, um, as I mentioned, 2020 definitely has accelerated um, our need to really amplify our inclusion and diversity conversations. And at Twitter, 
it did accelerate even our timeline for some of the trainings that we already had in plan for what we wanted to roll out. And we decided to, to do a lot more given the way the year was progressing, not just with the pandemic, but then also with, uh, with what happened, particularly in the US around the racial conversations that kicked off in the summer um, and everything that we were seeing happening there really kind of resonating across the globe in so many different countries. Um, and I think even for, to be honest, even for myself, um, I've been in the inclusion and diversity space um, for many years now, but to do these conversations in a virtual setting, to have a safe space that you need to create for employees to be able to share what they're going through or to create even unconscious bias trainings and facilitate them in a virtual setting was even something quite new for me. Um, and initially, I think there was there was that mental block that you think, oh, these conversations are so much better in person, and maybe it won't have the same effect as it needs to happen as as it needs to have. But honestly, I think um, this year has also once again showed us that we can rely on technology, and we've really been able to bring people together, even though we are so so um, distance from everyone. Uh, the one thing we realized with all of our trainings as well, with all of these conversations, is that you can't just take a uh, a very, you know, in our case, a very U.S. centric centric approach all the time. the The idea is to be able to bring people on that journey on inclusion and diversity with us, um, and we've relied very heavily on creating an allyship framework and being able to then say, you know, how do you now show up as an ally for different communities, particularly for conversations that matter in countries where you are. So yes, you know, in the US, you might want to be an ally for the black community or the Latinx community. And there are things that you can do, but you can take the same learnings and you can implement them and really use them for the countries where you live and the conversations that you want to drive. So we definitely do believe that a lot of our unconscious bias trainings that we've we rolled out and we've really doubled down on the conversations around racial justice, um, unconscious bias, allyship in particular, and really actions that need to be taken to show up as an ally. So not just using ally as an identity, but really what are the actions that you're taking so that people, so that you are showing up for communities that you want to help take those learnings and be able to implement them in the countries that you are uh, based in and the conversations that you want to drive. Um, they're not always the most comfortable conversations, of course. So for a lot of some of our folks as well that might not have had unconscious bias trainings before or really thought about leaning into these conversations, um, it is something new for them. But but that's what I think as a company, we encourage our culture to be um, to be you know fun, to be free, to have a lot of learning uh, available to, to people where um, we want our platform to reflect the diversity of the voices and we want people in our company to absolutely be reflective of that diversity and be inclusive so we've been able to create that space for our employees i believe even though it has been virtual it was challenging but i think we we have really leveraged um the the conversations that need to happen and it's it's an ongoing process for us for sure yeah so um now to add to what preet was saying so on certain level, this new normal, this pandemic really worked as a blessings in disguise, especially when it comes to certain conservative organizations who are hesitant to have uncomfortable conversations. Let's say LGBTI plus was very uncomfortable conversation for certain organizations who have conventionally been very conservative. So in this new normal, when everybody is working from home remotely, leveraging technology became that blessings for these organizations to run various programs it could be training sessions webinars sensitization workshops you know policy formation um, framework creation initiatives and educating employees so that way this new normal worked as a blessings in disguise other aspect to it is as preet briefly mentioned um, you know facing your own biases so certain level previously there was this excuse you know ignorance is bliss so like for example there is an effeminate colleague in your team and this manager trying to correct the behavior of that individual because the manager never knew that this is inclusion this somebody's you know different behavior doesn't mean you need to correct that individual without knowing it's it's in a way kind of corrective therapy right 
so now due to this sensitization workshops and sensitization trainings at least now individuals know that respect is what matters and we all have expression when it comes to gender expression we are entitled for our gender expressions similarly you know when it comes to gender pronoun let's say we, it has always been so binary you know now as we are talking constantly about gender pronouns at least there is this sensitization that is happening around respecting individual gender pronouns and the next step in this journey becomes zero tolerance for intolerance nobody can give an excuse that i didn't know i didn't know that correcting somebody's effeminate mannerisms can be discrimination or corrective therapy and then if still somebody is practicing such biases such discrimination then termination or taking some disciplinary action can become so effective and easy due to all these steps which have been followed so yeah that's that's what i wanted to add Okay, so um, in IBM, I would like to share one of my personal feelings is that when we are um, working remotely, uh, we should really think about a person, not on the person, his, him or herself, but also think of a person together with a family and their life. So um, for example, we have talked about working mother, we have talked about people with disabilities, LGBT group. So there are a lot of personas. Those personas, when, they, when, when we are working physically together with them, they are the same. So they are just our teammates. They are just our subordinates. They are just our uh, managers. However, when they are working at home, the persona can be different. So for example, working mother with a single lady, to compare with a single lady, their situation at home can be totally different. So when we are considering about working, re working remotely or working virtually, we should deal with people and consider their persona. So I think this is very important when we, are, um, when, when we try to improve the, the, the efficiency and reduce the bias. And also I think uh, in IBM, we depend heavy, very heavily on managers to create the climate of respect, of engagement. So uh, during the pandemic and also, uh, also till now, we are constantly training our managers to create this respectful climate. So uh, I, I, I would like to share one example. We have a work from home pledge for our managers. So there are there are some pledges I will I would like to share with uh, sh share, I would like to share here. For example, I pledge to be family sensitive. I pledge to support flexibility for, for personal needs. I pledge to support not camera ready times. So there are a lot of pledge that remind our managers that when you are working, and you should project that I have from the from the past several months. One is to recognize the different personas when people are working from home. The second one is to fully utilize the manager's power and manager's uh, impact to create the climate. So this is my sharing. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for your insights um, on what we learn in, in raising awareness, um, you know, in a virtual setting. So, um, in the beginning, we have talked about, you know, what is biases, you know, what's um, biases has, how bias change in terms of, you know, changing uh, workplace. And just now we also um, talk about like, what um, you have been doing in, in raising awareness on, you know, by managing biases with your employees and what you have learned. So I just wonder, um, what's next, um, you know, as, as the year go on and as you know the pandemic is still going on and in some part of the world is still going on and in some part like China we are, we are actually back to normal in the business. Um, so what's, what do you see uh, as bias for the future? What do you think if there's any new biases we need to address and if you can think of any you know, possible, possible new solutions for all these um, new biases.
I mean, that you should um, go first this time. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, um, as I mentioned in my um, earlier brief explanation, so we'll have to rehash, we'll have to revisit our definition of biases. Now, if we are running training courses, sensitization workshops based on the conventional examples of biases, on priority, we need to change that because this new normal has exposed or have introduced ourselves to this new set of biases. That's where now when we'll be back to site again, I mean, this is going to put forward some new set of challenges. So tackling those challenges, if we really want to work proactively towards it, if we want to really equip ourselves, the best way here is taking proactive steps rather than reactive steps. So whatever workshops we are running, whatever sensitization trainings we are running, whatever conversations we are running, on priority that needs to be revisited, that needs to be expanded, that needs to be inclusive of, or that, that, that needs to talk about the new biases that, that you know we are introducing due to these new, no, new normal. And then, so what I was saying, at the end of the day, what matters is respect. Every organizations, you know, when we talk about the culture, respect towards fellow colleagues is the foundation of that culture and respect in terms of every single interaction, not just written communication that happens over email. Respect is every single interaction that you're having with your fellow colleague on a daily basis, every single minute. Yeah, in this new normal, as these offices have entered our personal lives, that's where the lines are getting blurred between your professional life and your personal life. That might lead to compromising this respect because suddenly now everybody knows a lot of personal things about everybody and that's where it might lead to compromising that respect towards the other individual, especially when the individual is different, you know. That's where then reinforcing this thought process of respect reinforcing this, um, uh, you know, this, this um, behavior of respect with higher intensity proactively is what is required. And I'm sure it won't be that difficult once we are back to site if we take proactive steps. Organizations are taking the proactive steps. So once we are back to site, I think, um, yeah, it will be normal. It won't be that difficult. Yeah. Back to you, Ivy. Great, thank you. Um, Pratt, do you want to continue? Sure, I can, I can add to that. Um, I think I totally agree with Amita as well. And I think a little bit on a more personal level, I do feel that it kind of goes back to our initial conversation about unconscious bias. I think there's so much that's going on around the world right now. And as we're soaking everything in, I think at some level it is you know, impacting us as well, our own perceptions of what we think uh, how countries have managed the pandemic, um, you know, the various cracks in society that have been so amplified in 2020 and how they are being managed and what our colleagues or our friends might have said about a movement or something else, like all of that we're watching. And I think it is, it is going to create um, additional layers of complexities of how we think other people um, have done or what they've done over the year. And as we kind of go back to the office setting again, we're bringing all of that new context with us. So I really do hope that people lean in heavily into realizing, um, you know, once again, leading with empathy, leading with respect, the, the respectful workplaces, you know, that we've signed up for, it needs to exist for everyone. And really people leaning in heavily on allyship. That's the conversation that we've been driving, as I said, and really, hoping that um, all of these learnings that we're doing and all these great conversations that we're having and we were invited, you know, the uh, our community thought leaders to come in and share how communities are faring during this time. And I really hope that people remember the learnings and remember what people are going through at this point. And at the end of the day, when we all go back to work, when we're all interacting with people, you know, be kind. Uh, it's not been an easy year for anyone, but even outside of that, just in general, I think we need to find our humanity a lot more in the workplace than because of what we've been able to see this year. So I do really hope, I think things uh, potentially could be a lot worse for some people. Maybe other people haven't been as deeply impacted. So um, I think empathy and allyship, I really hope continues um, as we come out of all of this now. 
Okay, thank you, Preet. Um, also building on Amit and Preet's uh, introduction, I think um, I think in the in the next phase, one thing to improve the trust and the respect uh, in the virtual world is to stay connected, stay connected virtually. So, uh, for example, um, when you are physically together, you do team buildings, you see everyone day to day. Uh, however, when you are disconnected uh, physically, when you are connected virtually, you should also, you, you should continue this. You should continue the connection and uh, not only personally, but also between the families. For example, when, uh, when, when you know a working mother, you can check, uh, you can always check uh, about uh, her daughter, case, how they are doing, if they are doing well. So by knowing, their, by, by knowing her family well, you know her well. So you know uh, what's influencing their day-to-day -day work because now it's a world of work and life integration. The boundary between work and life now is disappearing. So when we are looking at a person, we are looking at a person, we should not only look at look him or herself, but also look, uh, look, look at his or, or her family and his and, his and her life. So um, I think this is one thing. And as a manager, if you are a manager in the organization, you should foster this connection. And in IBM, we are already doing and encouraging the managers doing the online team buildings so that people can stay connected. And uh, by, doing, by, by doing so, by staying connected, people build trust among each other. So I think the second, I think second very important topic is about the technology. We all talk about the technology. So um, if you are um, primarily working uh, physically together previously, now you should think, really think about how technology can help build an efficient team in the virtual world. So for example, in IBM, we use Miro, we use Trello, we use Slack to foster the collaboration online. And this really help us reduce the bias, overcome, overcome the barriers when people are working together. So this can be really helpful. So, and also it reduces the bias for, uh, for some people, for example, people with disabilities. So uh, when they can't read or hear virtually very well, the technology can help them. So create a more engaging world for them. So I think the technology is the, is the second priority that uh, companies should consider to reduce bias in the virtual world. Okay, back to you, Ivy. Great, thank you, thank you so much. So um, I just want to summarize what um, um, you know, um, speaker mentioned, um, really um, to prepare what the future are coming um, for us in terms of you know addressing um, and managing biases. I think we can divide it um, into three levels. One is uh, really on the top company level where um, companies should really adopt uh, more technologies in, in supporting um, individuals or employees in um, helping them to, um, to work more efficiently um, at, at, at home or outside offices, especially uh, for people with disabilities. And also, you know, taking uh, more proactive steps rather than, you know, reactive steps um, in supporting, um, um, you know, colleagues in addressing um, biases. And the second level is really for the manager's level in um, really educating them on uh, possibly, you know, making a pledge, like what George say um, in the conversation today, um, pledge to be more sensitive um, to um, people who have family, who, people, you know, who have, you know, extra needs at home. And really, and the third level would be individual level, which, uh, you know, each employees um, should stay connected uh, with each other virtually and physically and as you know work and life have integrated um, because of the circumstances um, that uh, are beyond of our control. Um, so I think um, this is um, our today's conversation. Um, is anything to add? Um, it's been a very grateful and very helpful session um, uh, today so thank you so much. Um, just um do you have anything to add um in the last um minutes? yeah so from my side maybe you know um what i would say is um the conversation around mental health have been normalized a lot in various organizations 
and that has been a very positive change due to this pandemic because you know nobody was prepared for this suddenly we went to this lockdown suddenly situation across the globe changed and no matter whether you are locked down with your family or you are hold up alone whether you are from the lgbti plus community or whether you are from the specially able section the pandemic did take a toll on everybody's mental health maybe the intensity varied varied mm. that's where organizations proactively took steps in normalizing this conversation you know helping colleagues understand that having issues with your mental health is perfectly fine providing assistance whenever required so i think that has been again been the second blessings in disguise due to this pandemic so um with that mm-hmm. i would say um please take care of your mental health um that is equally important uh, in case your organization is providing facilities to have these conversation assistance leverage that because mental health is something which is really which matters a lot because eventually that is where everything boils down so take care of your mental health be safe and take care thank you thank you thank you amita now i just want to say thank you ivy for hosting and thanks amita and troy for sharing um i found that quite informative so that's all great yes i also want to thank everyone thank you. for sharing so much uh and um uh i think this is a new norm and um a uh, new norm always brings on challenges a lot of challenges however things will be things will be well in the future and i think the pandemic is also opportunity for us to look back into ourselves and also into our families um so uh in my personal feeling in the past several months i stay a lot we i stayed much longer time with my wife and uh we find the more interesting life when we are together than being part of in the work in the work place so enjoy your life with your family right thank you thank you so much